So I'm here to talk about behavioral science. Um, so it's really taking a step back. Um, just to give you a sense of brain juice and who we are. We're a predominantly quantitative market research agency, actually. Um, and my background's um, almost exclusively quantitative. Uh, we do qualitative work, but only really when it feeds into qualitative research. Um, sorry, quantitative research, bigger quantitative research. Um, so you're probably wondering why you have a quantitative guy from a predominantly quantitative agency closing out the final day of a qualitative conference. Uh, it doesn't make a ton of sense. Um, what I will say is that we are quite innovative for a quantitative agency. Um, quantitative research, I think, lags behind qualitative, if that's even possible, in terms of actually changing and evolving and trying new things. Um, and what we are all about is applying the latest in the behavioral sciences to market research, to marketing. Um, and I think what the behavioral sciences have taught us about how people make decisions applies equally across qualitative and quantitative. Um, I really do. Um, I think the implications are quite profound. So what I'm going to try to do in the next 20 minutes, I'm down to 19 minutes now, or so, is give you a sense for what those implications are, um, the implications or the ramifications for qualitative research specifically, and then I'll talk about a case study of some qualitative research that we've done. Um, it is drink-related the case study. So if I'm stood between you guys and drinks, at least I'm sort of priming you in the true behavioral spirit to, uh, to go off and have fun at this evening's social. So research methods tugs of war. And I think you see this much more on the quantitative side, but it, to some degree on the qualitative side as well, right? On the one hand, you have people who are just wedded to very, very, very traditional methodologies. And on the other end of the tug of war, you have people who are just racing towards new shiny objects, um, really without a, a sort of thought to anything else and trying them out almost for themselves, right? Oops. Norm is sort of the enemy of those uh, sort of technophiles, if you want to call them, right? Quantitative, big, big, big quantitative businesses have been built on norms. Um, norm is almost like the Luddite of market research. If anyone paid any attention in high school history, they'll know who the Luddites are. They're sort of English textile workers in the 19th century during the Industrial Revolution who were protesting uh, their jobs being taken away by machinery. And Norm is, is very similar in that sense, right? sort of resist change at all costs. On the other hand, you have, do have people who race towards new technology. And I, I don't think at Bringer, so we're opposing new technology at all, actually. We're incredibly innovative and we really do love to try new things. I think though for us, trying a new thing just for the sake of doing something new isn't always the best way. And it misses, to some degree, the key point, right? And for us, that is is market research, marketing keeping up with psychology, right? If at heart what we're trying to do in market research is understand people, we shouldn't just be looking at technological innovation, technological change as the way to unlock that. Psychology is really what understanding people is all about. And in market research, marketing, at least commercially, what we're trying to do is understand that, diagnose it with the hope of somehow influencing it, right? So what we're looking at here is a series of different thinkers from the behavioral sciences. Um, the Gallup guys talked about Kahneman earlier, um, but there's just an array of different thinkers who I think genuinely have brought a new understanding, a very recent understanding, and I'm talking about the sort of last five to 10 years, of how people make the choices that they make, right? And it's a very, very significant advancement in how we think about the human condition. Now, all of these thinkers have very disparate hypotheses, very disparate viewpoints, but they would all more or less coalesce around the idea that human beings think a lot less than we like to think we think. We're all a little bit mentally lazy, right? In other words, all of you are a lot more like Homer Simpson than you would care to admit that you are, right? That's what all of these people would agree upon. Now, the big problem of that, the market research, traditional marketing, is that it invalidates the classical marketing model, right? The, the best description or the best analogy I've heard of that model is the hard fist of a rational brand proposition wrapped in the velvet glove of emotion, right? In other words, if you think about any type of marketing activity, it's all based around the idea 
that people are thinking creatures, right? If you're running a, a concept, you catch their attention with an insight. If it's a piece of communication, you creatively catch it. And as soon as you've caught their attention, you hit them over the head as hard as you possibly can um, with all of the rational reasons why your product, why your brand, why your service is vastly superior. It has a key point of difference, where in many concepts, you know, at least 20 points of difference over all of the other options that people have available, right? That's a very thinking-based model in a world where we don't like to think very much at all. And that's the problem with it. Science itself is very, very counterintuitive in the same way that human beings are. Light objects actually fall faster than heavy objects. Steam is lighter than air. It's actually safer to skydive than run a marathon. I didn't know that. That one was one that surprised me. I don't intend to do either, but um, good to know. One, two, three, four, five, six is as likely to win the lottery as any other combination. It's also just as likely that you would win it a second time if you've already won it once. You know, winning the first time doesn't have any impact on your likelihood to, to actually win it. Don't break if you're sliding on ice. I wish someone would have told my wife that before she uh, crashed this winter. And behavior precedes attitudes, right? That flies in the face of the classical marketing model. That's a model that assumes that if I hit you over the head and educate you on all of the different reasons why my brand, my product, is better than everybody else's product, you will then act in the way that I want you to act. That can happen, it can happen in that order, but a lot of the time, it doesn't. People think a lot less than we like to think they think. Behavior doesn't always precede attitudes. We think a lot less than we like to think. So the guys from Gallup sort of talked a little bit about Kahneman, um, system one, system two. So I'm not going to go into it too much. Um, system one, obviously, as a recap, is uh, the quick, fast, implicit part of the brain. It's very emotional. It's very distinctive. It processes information much, much, much more quickly than system two, which is much more cognitive, much more rational. We rely on our system one to get through everyday life. And if you just think about the millions of decisions that each of you have made today, you can see the extent to which system one guides us. So it's uh, 5.15, but to demonstrate, I want everybody to save the color of the letters on the screen behind me. All together, red, blue, Okay, so you can see a system one in, uh, in action, right? System one response, and then your system two comes in as an override. And if you think about all of the various different decisions you've made today, from sitting at the front or not sitting at the front, right? Nobody is at the front for any, for a very obvious reason. It's a system one reaction, right? There's really no rational reason not to sit at the front, but it's a system one gut reaction to sort of all fall to the back and, uh, and sit uh, hiding or uh, smiling from, from the back. Brands that tap into people's system one are more successful. I'm pretty sure that everybody can name the brands that are on the screen at the moment. Again, that's your gut system one reaction to different brands. You're able to access them. If you can have a brand that accesses system one, you will be more successful. So, most decisions are quick, intuitive, and emotional. We don't weigh up options, system one versus system two, despite the classical marketing model asking us to. And most of market research then focusing very much on measuring system two. Profitable brand, profitable brand growth needs a long-term focus on three things. And at Brain Juicer, we've linked these three things to actual brand growth. Fame, feeling, and fluency, right? Fame is essentially how mentally accessible your brand is. If your brand comes to mind more quickly than all of the other options available, if it's mentally available, you will be chosen more often than all of the other choices that I have. Feeling, that's the trigger to actually make a decision. So if I feel strongly about a brand, I'll choose it, if I feel strongly positively at least. And fluency, these are all of the little distinct assets that all add up to allow us to mentally access a brand without thinking in a world where we don't like to think very much. Great example of that is the current election. So this data was actually collected, I think in February, before the sort of first round of primaries, but applying this model to political brands, you can see even back in January, February, we're predicting Hillary and Trump as the two front runners. That's exactly what's happened. The 
concerning or not concerning, depending on what aisle of, uh, side of the aisle you sit on, is that the election's actually going to be a lot closer, according to our model, than you might think it is. Hillary has a feeling advantage over, over Trump, for sure, right? But Trump is dominating the fame stakes and the fluency stakes. If you actually diagnose what the fluency is, all of the headlines, all of the slogans, all of the sound bites, the broad sweeping things that allow us to access either candidate in a world where we don't want to think very much fall in Trump's favor, right? So fame, feeling, fluency, and our prediction would be that the election is going to be almost too tight to call, at least based on this data set from back in February. So fame, feeling, fluency, that's what drives brand growth. Qualitative research is much, much, much more about understanding and diagnosing understanding. And so to sort of bring that to life a bit in terms of the implications of behavioral science for, for market research and for qualitative market research, it's a slightly different framework that we put forward. Framing, feeling, and copying. So context really matters. How people feel dictates the response that we give at any moment, and it's a very interchangeable, um, fluid state. So my answer on Tuesday might differ from my answer on Wednesday. And copying. We're social creatures. We're very good at noticing, copying the behaviors that other people have. We're not very good at making our own decisions in a vacuum. So I'll give an example of each one and then talk a little bit about the implications, at least as we see them, for qualitative research. Framing. Rolls-Royce, they actually sell more cars at boat shows now than they do in car showrooms. Right? That's a little known fact. Doesn't make any sense. The reason is if I'm spending, I'm not, by the way, business has been great, but not that good. But if I was spending $7 million on a yacht, spending 250 grand or 350 grand on a Rolls Royce would almost be like saving money, right? Doesn't make any sense, but my anchor point in that context is completely different. So framing is just vitally, vitally important. And I think that any qualitative research it's just so, so, so key to get as close to or recreate the environment and the choice environment itself. Doing work in a vacuum, focus groups, in a nice facility, no matter how nice it is, just simply doesn't recreate the way in which that decision, the decision that the consumer makes, is going to be constructed. Okay? So the environment is absolutely key. You must, must recreate it in qualitative research. And you have so much more flexibility to do that in core than you do in quant. Personal feeling. So an example of, of how this changes and how it can be influenced, and it's a, it's a dilemma for marketers, and I think also an opportunity, because the fluidity of it really is very unpredictable. But the opportunity to influence it is really, really key, right? So this was a study um, on judges, right? So what you're looking at here are the number of cases that a judge had over the course of a day, and then the proportion of decisions that were favorable to the defendant. And in this case, the defendant was actually applying for parole, right? So if any of you have the misfortune, I guess, to appear before a court of law and before a judge, the optimal time to actually appear would be after a break. And that's what's signified by these little dots here, right? Kind of shocking in the sense that judges, we would like to think, gosh, if I'm in court, I just want a fair trial, right? That's all I want. I want the judge, the impartial judge, to hear the facts, hear the evidence, and interpret that evidence and sentence me, you know, at least in a fair and partial way. But the bad news is, if I appear right before he's going off on his break to get his lunch, his or her lunch, or right before he or she needs the bathroom, I'm more likely to be turned down for parole than I am to be accepted. Right? Why is that? Because it's the easier choice. Right? We're tired, we've heard too many cases, nobody's going to fire the judge for turning down this, this criminal and sending them back to prison for another two years. There is a risk involved in actually understanding, it's hard work to understand the evidence, and there's a risk involved in setting a person free. So even judges are affected by feeling. And I think the qualitative research you have to understand how a person's feeling in order to actually get a genuine understanding of why they've made the choice they've made. No perfect way to do that. I think quantitatively we've, we've developed measurement tools for the feeling and 
I could certainly see in some of the eye tracking stuff that you're sort of touching on measuring where people are focusing and there are tools out there that can measure actual emotions as well. But I think qualitatively it's just a case of having people tell their stories. Once they get into that narrative, we're conditioned as human beings to start telling our stories. Once you sort of you know, do the narrative and you actually let them go and talk about what they want to talk about, can really get to the personal factors that are influencing their choices. Okay? Final one would be social. Very good at copying. Right? Best example of that would be Crocs. There's absolutely no reason anybody in the modern age should be wearing Crocs unless they're a medical professional. Yet the brand was very, very successful. I said was, there was actually someone on my flight on the way down here who was wearing Crocs that I, I noticed. But why would we do that if we're not a doctor or a physician or a nurse? It's because we're good at copying other people, right? And I think, you know, for qualitative research, it's all about priming people to actually predict what other people are going to do. You know, the, the sort of cliche of the, the moderator saying, I don't want to hear about other people, I want to hear about you. And actually, it should be the other way around. We actually do want to hear what other people are going to do. We don't want to hear what they're going to do. If you ask me what I'm going to have for dinner, I'd probably tell you I'm going to have a salad, right? Because I'm really, really trying hard to, to, to kind of live a more healthy lifestyle. Wouldn't be lying to you guys, right, at 525. I'd just be giving myself the benefit of the doubt. If you to ask you guys, predict what Alex is going to have for dinner, you don't really know me at all, I'm pretty sure you're not going to say, oh, he's going to have a salad. <laughs> You're much more accurate at predicting my behavior than I am at giving you my own. So we want people to tell us about what other people are going to do. That's what we're good at as social creatures. And I think in qualitative research, you really do have a lot of liberty to do that. So methodological ramifications, get as close to context as possible. Story and seduction, not data and deduction. Me to we research, the social. And I think that framework has to run right across the analytical process as well. Right At the end of, of qualitative analysis, you have to apply a behavioral lens. If you believe people make decisions using their system one, you have to apply a system one framework during analysis as well. And this is brain juices framework. It doesn't mean that it's wrong or right. We believe in it. Um, but I would just urge everybody to really deploy a behavioral lens as they look at qualitative data. So an example. This is some work that Brainjuice did in the UK. Um, so I think there's a couple of Brits in the audience. I'm sort of British, but not so much anymore. But um, the national pastime of, of the UK is binge drinking. <laughs> it's been an ongoing issue for many years. This is an old newspaper headline. You can see Tony Blair was still the, still the prime minister at the time, and he hasn't been the PM for a long, long time. But at the time, he was expanding opening hours to all of these different uh, bars. They used to have to shut at 11 o'clock, and he was moving to be open 24 hours. And you can see he was defending it by saying, you know, people who have been to the theatre shouldn't be penalised from having a quick drink afterwards just because all the bars are shut. I'm not sure how many of these people on the page had just come out of the theatre, <laughs> but... I guess, you know, we're, we're catering to all, all audiences. And I can say I grew up in uh, Hull, which is a, a fantastic place if anyone wants to ever visit. Um, you know, beautiful people out binge drinking. So we were commissioned by a, by a uh, charity, actually, in the UK, um, which was actually working from a public policy standpoint to reduce the amount of binge drinking, right? They wanted to understand what was driving people to drink, you know, binge drink. And what tactics could we recommend to actually reduce the amount of binge drinking? So, environmental factors, context. What we did was actually send people out to focus on these factors. What was the context? Well, there was some really obvious stuff, right? You've all been in a bar where the music is so loud, you can't hear yourself talk, you, know, you can't really have a conversation, so you drink more, right? You just drink more quickly, that's what, that's what happens. If you've got a big glass of beer and it's cold and you're stood up because there's no tables, you drink more quickly. If you don't have anywhere to put your glass down at all, you have to stand there holding it, you can't have a conversation because of the music, you drink more and more and more quickly. These are all environmental factors right, that influenced the speed with which people were drinking. 
It's not a lot that Drink Aware, the charity we were working with, could really recommend in that sense. They can't sort of force pubs to have, you know, lower music. They can't force pubs to have tables. You know, we don't want to make beer less cold. That would sort of fly in the face of people having a nice drink. But they are important factors to think about. Things they can recommend policy to influence. A lot of the imagery in, in bars and pubs sort of create this, this idea of life and soul. You know, someone who gets drunk is out dancing. The anchor points in various bars are clear. Double up anchors people to the idea that doubling up on your spirits, so you have a double gin and tonic rather than just a gin and tonic, is a good thing to do. It's socially acceptable. Is that sort of anchor point okay? We can certainly recommend that that sort of communication is outlawed. It's an open question, but I think only by understanding the context of what people are seeing do you start to arrive at those types of recommendations. You have to see it through an environmental, contextual lens. Personal hot states. So I'm pretty sure we've all been there, right? You're out, you're having fun, you know you have to get up for work the next day, you probably shouldn't have another one, but the party's just getting started and you just, you know, you kind of do it anyway, right? Looking at personal factors, that's a lot of what we noticed, but only through viewing it through that lens do you start to think, okay, well, how could we actually affect that? How can we interrupt different personal hot states, right? Lots of different ways to do it. You put your card behind the bar, and you run a tab, and you're just ordering drinks, ordering drinks, ordering drinks. What if the bartender was to tell you after each round what your tab was running at? Right? That would interrupt that hot state. That would shake you out of your system one mind, ordering more drinks, and think, geez, I've spent you know, 150 bucks already. Maybe that final couple of drinks isn't worth it. Maybe I should make a different decision after all. In the US, at least, we've actually started deploying a lot of that already, right? There's a limit at um, sports games around how many drinks you can get at the bar for each person. I think it's two usually. You can only buy two drinks um, you know, at any given time. Again, is that sort of recommendation likely to interrupt the hot state? It may feel counterintuitive, as with much of behavioral science, but making people more comfortable, giving them a seat, right, and giving waitress service, waiter service, um, really interrupts the flow. It interrupts that hot state. It partitions between different rounds of drinks, slows down the drinking process, all recommendations to think about. People are idiots, right? <laughs> drinking is sort of the extreme example of that, in the sense that the more we drink, probably for most people, the bigger idiot we become. <laughs> Completely irrational. You know, what we saw in our qualitative was a lot of people talking about a hangover, and a hangover typically is a negative thing, particularly if you have to work. And certainly in my early career, I remember sitting through many, many, many Fridays at work. I, I, looking back now, I don't know how I managed to do it. But it actually became a badge of honor, right? A lot of the people we were studying, they, they were sort of talking about the hangover in social media, you know, boasting about it almost, talking about, um, you know, the different food options that they had available, dirty food options to cure it. Right? The hangover almost became a good thing. So extreme rational thought requires extreme irrational feedback and ideas. So what if we made the final round of drinks free? Right? Feels very, very irrational, but one of the reasons that people were drinking so much and always having that final drink was because they'd sort of bought it, right? Even if I didn't want it, I'd bought it. Therefore, I'm going to drink it. What if it was free? What if I didn't have any sort of bearing on it? It didn't have my endowment in that sense. Would I drink less? Possibly. So very, very irrational subject matter. Behavioral science suggests what often feels counterintuitive. Final one is social. So um, the Gallup presentation talked a little bit about res reciprocity. Um, it's a tongue twister for the end of the day. But, you know, buying rounds of drinks, um, again, huge social activity. You can't sort of welch on your round, you can't leave without buying a round, encourages more and more and more drinking. In the UK, they used to sort of ring the last order bell, um, so that sort of reminded people to get to the bar and buy that last round. Again, what if we weren't to do that? What if the recommendation was that that practice was outlawed? Would that encourage people to drink less? The key point here is really that looking at all of this through a behavioural lens 
actually gets to a sort of closer truth to what's going on, rather than just asking people direct questions. And it allows you to make more creative recommendations. Definitely recommendations that sort of buck the, the trend of, of what you might otherwise have done. One final point. I purposely left this to the end because the way we did this study was via mobile ethnography, right? Huge, huge fans of technology. But the key point is that it's the behavioral framework that's most important, at least in terms of this presentation, right? The mobile ethnography really becomes a tool to deploying that. And you could have deployed the, the behavioral model through various different avenues, different channels, different methodologies. But really, the mobile piece is, is what sort of allowed us to access people 24-7, right? We allowed, we empowered participants to go off and study their groups of friends. Key part, but it's a tool. And I think for us, that feeds back to our first point around, is marketing keeping up with psychology versus is it keeping up with technology? Technology, you know, when it blends with that psychological framework is most powerful. Technology in and of itself is not the end. So, key points. Most important question to ask, is research keeping up with psychology? Execute and analyze according to a non-thinking behavioral framework. And look for the place where you confuse psychology with the technology, right? That's what I just mentioned. That's where it's going to be most powerful. So really, that's, that's it.